Hi everyone, it's me, Krillius, Team Racing Productions co-host and moderator. And joining me is the High Priestess of Love, Racine Pendarvis. Greetings and salutations all. Joining us is Craig. Welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having me. This is such an honor. I'm so excited to be here with y'all. Thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. And we're happy to have you. So our viewers who don't know, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, my name is Craig Seymour. I'm DC to the bone, born in DC, raised in DC. I'm a music critic. I've been writing about music um, starting in DC um, for almost 30 years. And I'm the author of a number of books, including a biography of Luther Vandross and a memoir that's kind of about the DC club scene that kind of raised me up. So yeah, that's me. And now I live in Miami Beach. Beautiful. I still love DC. <laughs> well, Craig, we are so glad to have you here. And we are so excited to talk about a couple of your books and get into the meat of the matter. So first of all, let us Not talk. Not the meat. Yes, the meat. <laughs> we love the meat. So, um, speaking of meat, uh, <laughs> let me take that out. No, but let us talk about um the the biography, of course, of Luther Vandross. You know, tell us how you got started with that. Why you wanted to look at Luther's life. And what the process was like, you know, creating that and really getting deep into everything Luther Vandross. Yeah, well, um, I guess I, I'm sure a lot of people can concur with this. I mean, if you grew up in the late 70s, early 80s, I mean, Luther was voice was just all around you. You heard it in commercials. You heard him singing background. And when he came out solo, it was just such a part of the culture and part of life so I mean you know Luther is just a core part of who I am Luther's music and so when he um when I finally started being a music critic and he was re- dropping a new album in 2001 mm-hmm. with the song with you know take take you out on it I got an assignment from Vibe to go to Jamaica and interview him about that mm. and you know we were hanging out. It was like a whole weekend. We were hanging out. We were kikiing. You know, it was just, it was a whole vibe. So I, I just loved it. And I loved his openness and his energy and everything. And so when I decided I wanted to write a book, there were a variety of different subjects and everything. And this just really came about in a very organic way. And I'm so glad it was sort like a lot of things in life. It was I wouldn't say happenstance, but it wasn't necessarily something that was that I was like burning to do. It wasn't mm-hmm. something that there were all these opportunities for me to do it. It was kind of like it was the opportunity at the right time. Mm-hmm. And now looking back, the book came out in 2004. So now looking back almost, um, not good at math, 20 years later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 20 years later, don't do math on live. Anyway, 20 years later. I'm just so I can't be more thrilled that that act- that I was able to do that and that actually represents something that I was able to contribute to the culture. So I just I lo- I love it. I'm very I'm very proud of that. Wonderful. And you know, you said you hung out with him in Jamaica, and I must say, Jamaicans are huge fans of Luther Vandross, especially during the early 2000s. You could not go anywhere in Jamaica, any party, any gathering, any school party, like anything, anywhere, and not here, Luther Vandras. So that that to me is very hilarious that you got to spend some time with him in Jamaica. What was his personality like? What was his temperament like um, when you got to spend some time with him? I mean, he was just like people, somebody I knew all my life. He like, we, you know, as soon as we just started talking and blah, blah, blah. And I, he, I said something, he bloop, bloop, bloop. You know, he was just going back and forth, but in a playful way. You know what I mean? Like, um, it was, I mean, from jump. I, we, I think the first time I met him, if I'm not 
I'm mistaken, I was there when he was doing, this was when he was kind of, um, I guess, on a fitness journey and he was doing a step class. And so I was watching him, he's doing his stuff. And then afterwards, I don't know, we immediately got in it. Like I was asking him something about the Supremes. As a lot of people know, Diana Ross and Supremes was um, one of his favorite groups. And he was saying something. I would think I was saying, because I really like the 70s Supremes too. So I was saying something about that. And he was saying, oh yeah, I like the original thing. I was like, oh, so you got something against Gene Jarrell? <laughs> and then <laughs> 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 he was like, I didn't say I had anything to, to, against Gene Terrell. Can't I like red without hating blue? So I mean, we, <laughs> from the beginning, we were just bop, 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 bop. Um, and the great thing about it, I mean, he was at a point in his life that he definitely was not ready to publicly talk about his sexuality or anything like that. And that was clear. But he also didn't try to gaslight me into mm. thinking that I was seeing something that I wasn't seeing. Like he was very, <laughs> he was just like, you are just, he, would, he said to me, you are just circling the airport. You are never going to land. But <laughs> he knew where the airport was. You know what I'm mm, like? like we weren't in confusion about the fact that there was an airport. But mm. he was just saying he wasn't going to let me land that plane. Mm. So I just appreciated that kind of openness. And he was not trying to front. He wasn't trying to code switch with me or anything like that. Like he was just, we were just. I love you know, it. Right I off love the bat. It. <laughs> y'all were letting your hair down. You know? yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I can imagine what that conversation was. Like I, I pictured our conversation with Luther. Uh, good food, good kiki, and, and, and just a whole lot of good teas and background stories. I remember having a conversation with Alpha Anderson, and Alpha was telling her, telling us about those early days of session work and how Luther taught her how to harmonize. And I think about the experience, you know, picture, you know, Luther, Gwen, Alpha, Valerie, Sissy. You know, you know, Brenda White King, King you know, Brenda, Lisa, Fozzie, you know, all of them in a room. Oh, my God. You know, just doing it and doing it. I mean, and, you know, you know, people just does, you know, to know Luther is to celebrate his artistry as a singer, as a songwriter, as an artist, as someone who has been on the background, on the forefront. He just had such a wonderful wealth of history when it came to music. And everyone who knew him or worked with him always had the wonderful things about how he was such a perfectionist when it came to harmonizing. You know, how he was like, uh-uh, I need it on this note. You off, you on the wrong note. I need you to come <laughs> back here on this note, baby. I don't need you to be up here. I need you to be right down here, you know? And he, he just had such a great ear how he would say, okay, you take the bottom, I'm going to take the middle, and you take this. Boom. You know, I was like, you know, Luther, his, and he left us with such a beautiful legacy. Yeah, I have a great story, actually, about his perfectionism that when I was at the sound check for the Jamaica show, because like I was saying before, this was just when he was launching that um, self-titled album in 2001, and Take You Out was the first single. But it hadn't really, it hadn't been released or anything, it, or maybe it, it just dropped. So this was the first show, it was a Mother's Day show in Jamaica. So you can imagine how lit that was. Mm. But it, it, it was so he was teaching them the song, and I'm listening. I'm just grooving, and then all of a sudden he stop, 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 stop. Oh, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. because the, there's a lyric in there. I take you to the movie to a, a part. Mm -hmm. And you know how we say movies. Oh, I'm going to the movies. You know how we want to plural everything. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody's saying plural, he's like, wait, wait, wait. It is one movie. We are going to one movie. We are not going to the movies. We are going to a movie. And I was like, all right. And you know, that's not even something that I would have heard or picked up on. But he was that. A lot of people would just say, let it go. But he was mm -hmm. like, no, it is one movie. We are not going to the movies. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. I mean, you know, I just, you know, let me ask you this. You know, they're working on a documentary about the story of Luther. I wonder have the, uh, the powers that be have reached out to you because I feel like you such a, you should be a part of that. Thank you. Um, 
kind of sort of ish i mean i had i've definitely been in touch with them um and my i'm offering i've given them all my interview tapes i've given them anything they want from me i'm available to give simply because i i think luther's story is so important and i want to preserve his story and it's not so much about like me being in something or me being a part of it of course you're gonna use my stuff you're gonna have to write me a little bit of a check if i'm Venmo, me some cash app whatever but i'm just saying like i want all of my research and stuff to be available because i want the story to be told the right way i mean you know people often only get one biopic one documentary or one thing like that and i don't i, I want that to be represented not for me but just for luther for the culture and everything like that so i'm any not even just this documentary but anybody that has ever wanted to do something on luther i have always been open to sharing anything that i have because it's bigger than me okay how about that and talking about you know going into the next segment about your other book that has such a interesting title tell us a little bit about that well, now I know you know a little bit about that, <laughs> but basically DC used to be basically, it, I mean, it really used to be called like the um, the capital of the gay strip club world because through some very odd zoning rules <laughs> and things, the, the um, strippers were allowed to be fully naked. So it was, obviously that was a draw. <laughs> <laughs> growing up in the 70s I guess I was born in 68 so like you know coming of age in the 70s 80s just the whole idea of like especially in DC you know if you were trying to check out a guy or something like that I mean that was something you really had to police yourself you really had to be you couldn't just be all on the red line like oh you fine you know mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, that could be put you in a dangerous situation so I felt such a freedom when I went to strip clubs just to be able to actually like look at a guy and just be able to like check the guy out and do all that kind of stuff in a safe space where I didn't feel like my safety was being threatened. So it was a very foundational part of my um, identity. And then also they were just so much a part of the D DC gay scene because there was a block that had um, Zigfields, um, mm -hmm. Secrets, Mm -hmm. Lakaj, I fall, you know, all of these places all in the same block and they had um, drag performances and everything. So people, I mean, the block was hot. Like you would just go to, I mean, you could just go there on a stat park. Some people didn't even go in the club. Some people just hung out on the, you know, cars outside. It was just a time. And so uh, because that's now gone, because they built, um, what is it, a soccer stadium or baseball stadium, somebody's stadium, they built something. <laughs> but that whole scene is gone and I just really felt a need to preserve that because also a lot of times when gay history is preserved, it's sort of like sanitized for mm -hmm. what you know, this kind of like assimilationist type politics and stuff like that. And I really wanted to represent how this queer culture was for queer people at that particular time, point blank period. And um, again, I was glad that Again, it wasn't even, it was funny, it wasn't even my idea to write the book. It was something somebody suggested to me, but it was another one of those things. Like I say, look at God, like, I'm so glad that I preserved this history because I had no idea when I wrote this in, came out in 2008, I wrote it around 2005. All the clubs were still open. Yeah. They, I don't, not sure even the plans were for the entire block to be destroyed or anything like that. So I did not go into it with the intention of preserving this scene that was going to be completely demolished by gentrification. I just did it because, hey, you know, it was my experience and I thought it was a good idea and hey, whatever. And I'm so glad that I did now. I'm glad you did to preserve that you. wonderful, you know, nightlife. It, it plays a big, important role in who we are, you know, everything about life, life. And, and talk about how drag is, you know, it's not a crime, it's a revolution, you know, you know, and all part of that experience of who we are in that LGBTQIA spectrum, you know, and, you know, shaking it up at the, at the strip club, you know, making it rain, you know, all of that is, you know, a part of who we are. It is, you know, and that book 
the way you wrote it just tells the story of what it was like. You know, I can picture myself just walking down to the street to get to the clubs, you know, and you uh, it painted such an amazing picture and did it so well. You. And now people who go to the, uh, the, you know, to the national stadium have no idea what that stroll and what that <laughs> was really about. <laughs> hey, I'm sure there's some ghosts in the bathrooms or something. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and that's why it's so important that, you know, this book is available because, you know, reading that book and being able to have that, it, as we've said before, it is a preservation of, you know, Black queer history, you know, it is a preservation of that because now people aren't able to have those same experiences. They're not able to have those similar experiences in those similar, in those similar places in this city anymore it's just not a thing that they're able to do so being able to have that and to preserve that is also important it's also important to preserve black music history and you do your best with doing that as well talk a little Try. bit about that <laughs> about preserving black music history as well well i mean i just can't think of anything that has shaped me more in life than music and it's just, it's the was the vehicle through which I learned so much, whether it's culture or politics or everything. Because I came up in the age of you know like Stevie Wonder albums, and you're reading about people, and you're you know, or Tina Marie Square Biz, and she's throwing out all these names, and you're going like, well, who is this person? Well, who is it? Well, let me read about this. I mean, Nina Simone. I grew up on Nina Simone, and just you know, learning about the struggles like Mississippi goddamn and stuff so it's just the core of who I am and as a person that was interested in music criticism when I would read the Rolling Stones the things like that the mainstream publications I never saw black music represented in the way that I experienced it and that I felt like my community experienced it it was always this focus on the stuff that white people like you know what I mean so it's like mm -hmm. instead of focusing on let's say Denise Williams' entire career, people wanted to just say, oh, I love that, let's hear it for the boy. You know, it was just so much about, so much reductionism with Black artists that I just felt compelled to address that. You know, I was kind of raised like, you find what it is that you do, and then you use that in the service of the community, in the service of other people. And so once I found kind of like writing was my lane, then it was like, okay, well, this is my purpose. This is what I'm supposed to do. And um, yeah, I, I feel that very deeply and I hope that I'm representing. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's my, I really hope that I'm helping to preserve, you know, helping not just to preserve the history, but to make sure that it's framed in the appropriate way, that it's framed in how black folks appreciate it not because it crossed over to the pop charts or but I could not care less you know I care about things like the quiet storm and what were big on the quiet storm um playlist and things like that what was bumping in the clubs what was playing out of the cars that's what I remember and that's what I try to preserve and you do such an excellent job with that when I think about, you know, how we connected via social media. And I happened to read one of your posts about music. And I was like, oh, well, honey, this is my twin right here. We have, <laughs> we have, we, we have, we have just clicked in. And I just went through all of your, your posts. And I was like, child, this child is, is in my head. What is going on? You know, I mean, it was just, you know, knowing when you connect how music connects people you know and the importance of stories you you write and you tell you 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 dwell into if you go into when you talk about a song you go into the making of the song who wrote it who was singing background who was in the studio where they recorded it in the studio what city where they go for lunch <laughs> yes 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 all of that it's like baby give them the full background the context who that really song was written about you know where did their frame of mind the breakup when aretha was going through her man troubles when people don't know when she was married to ted honey when she was singing them song in them early days she was telling them story <laughs> Oh. Yes. Yeah. You know, but but I mean, I feel like 
that's the way I grew up, like just growing up and like the radio was on, you know, somebody in the room would go, well, now you know Aretha Franklin. Oh, you know who that's about. Oh, now you know. Like, I just feel like I grew up in such a rich era of just my elders and just people in the community always sharing musical knowledge and musical history. And then it kind of like, I think I got to a point in my life when I wanted to try to find those type of stories in a written way. They just weren't there. They just weren't preserved in the way that people really experienced them and they were passed down to me. So I'm just was kind of like, I need to preserve that voice and that kind of approach to Black music. You know, and when you talk about that, folks who were, are viewing, how can they uh, know about you? And tell us about what's upcoming. Um, well, they can know about me. I'm at Craig's Pop. Oh, there we go. Come on, graphic. Um, <laughs> at Craig's Pop Life on basically all the social media. I'm most active on Twitter, and I do put out a weekly um, newsletter where I post kind of archival articles on um, Black gay life or things related to Black gay culture. Like this past week, I posted an article from Players where LaWanda Page talks about, people know her as Aunt Esther from San Francisco, where she talks about the drag performers that helped her get into comedy and stuff like that. So I do things like that. And I just, I, I'm working on a bunch of different things, projects that are kind of in similar to the same vein. And if you follow me, that's the best way to kind of keep up with it. I don't want to say too much now because then the second you say something, then somebody's you know, blowing up your DM. But when's that coming out? Well, why is that, that? You know, you can't have said it five for five minutes and somebody's, you know, all worrying you. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give any specifics, but you definitely can keep. I always um, let people know what's going on. And if you want to read my older stuff, um, some of my older articles, you can go to rnbeing.com. And that's where I've kind of compiled all my various, uh, all the things that I've written over the years. Awesome, awesome. Well, viewers, please look in the description below for links. Craig, it has been such a pleasure getting to chat with you, getting to have this good old Kiki. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you all for all you do. Um, you know, Gracie and you already know. Um, I just thank you all. My heart is full. I really appreciate it. Thank you. To our viewers, please follow Team Racing Productions on social media and click around our YouTube channel and check out your other interviews, blogs, forums, and more. And while you're there, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Racine, what would you like to say to our viewers? Viewers, thank you for watching.